Hello everybody and welcome to Handmade Hero Show where we code a complete game live on stream. We just got done patching the stupid call that does the stupid query to stupid Twitch to see if the stream is live, which they changed the API for no frickin' reason, so we had to go do that. Uh, and so now, in theory, the watch page is working again, uh, because now it's using the new API, which is exactly the same as the old API, but they changed the words. So that was great. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, and jump into what we're doing today. Uh, we are trying to work on our lighting algorithm here. Uh, there's the little curl hanging around from that, that Twitch uh, extravaganza there. Uh, let me go ahead and load up a uh, <clears throat> run of the program here so you can see where we were at. Um, last stream, we got blending working in a rudimentary way and the voxel uh, stabilized so that as we hop around and go between things, as you can see now, the lighting is very stable and does smooth blending uh, as you go. And I don't know, there may be some errors in it. Uh, we don't really know. We just kind of barely uh, did that. We do have a couple things we probably need to work on. Like, for example, you can kind of see we don't, for whatever reason, we've got some... Um, We've got some issues with how we pull things into the active set. You can see uh, the way I'm looking at it here. When you have a large room like this and we grab a room off the other end, you can see there's, there's a chance you just won't grab uh, enough stuff. So we do have a little bit of an issue with the way we're doing our bounds. I'm not going to worry too much about that right now. Those are the sorts of things that we can probably clean up later on in the pipe. Um, so I'm not really worried about those, but I'm just trying to see... Uh, to what extent we we have stability here. You can see there, I'm not thrilled about what's going on there. Um, I, I think though that that may, I don't really know, that may just be about uh, who's finding which light sources and when. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about those exactly yet either because the voxel seems very stable. That seems to just be maybe a light switch. So most of these things I'm going to say at the moment we can hold off on until we're doing uh, sort of different debugging. Uh, in, a, in a situation that doesn't have a hacky like light source choosing in there because we're about to get rid of that. Um, so I'm going to say that's really pretty stable for our purposes and that we can move on to the next step, which is uh, the full lighting solution. Again, the main problem we're going to have now is once we engage the full lighting solution, we're going to be interpreting a single light field. That's probably not really what we're going to want to do. Um, and, uh, and so moving up to the multi-light field uh, is probably really going to be where the problem comes in for us. Uh, so that's what we're going to have to take a look at. But for right now, we're just going to focus on getting the multi-bounce in there so that we're not in flashlight mode. But it's getting pretty close, right? Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and, and load up uh, the, the part of the code that we haven't finished yet that we need to finish for today's uh, work. And so if I jump over to the lighting code here, uh, hopefully what you can see, if I jump down... Uh, to the, the voxel lighting sample, which is this code right here, uh, it should just have a, a nothing in it. Yeah, right, you see? And so we've got a to-do here. This is the thing we want to fill in. And what has to happen, this is basically, you know, there's, there's nothing actually different that we're going to do here. It's just because we have part of the lighting done on the CPU side, part of the lighting done on the GPU side, and that's because we don't really want to require, you know, a NVIDIA RTX part or something. Um, we're doing the ray casting on the CPU side. So what that means is that when the um, when the CPU needs to compute lighting at a point using last frames data, um, it's going to have to do that using a uh, using information uh, that would normally be something you'd sample in the pixel shader. So if, for example, we go to the ZBIAS program here that we're actually using uh, for pretty much all of the the things that we draw, you can see here that we have a thing called sunlight. And some light is literally like the code we need, right? So if you take a look at what's supposed to happen here, uh, literally the thing that's supposed to happen is this, right? So the pixel shader is, is already the code that we need. So we know the code that we need. Um, it's literally this. And we just need to figure out how to do that in our code because our code doesn't have, it doesn't, um, run pixel shaders, right? The pixel shader is code we wrote uh, that runs on the GPU. But if we look at it, because we already did some work to help ourselves out, because we sort of knew this was the case, and we wanted to keep these code paths similar, what you can see is that we actually wrote our pixel shader to use 
exactly the same syntax as our regular code. And we did that, of course, uh, for those of you who don't remember, we did that by putting in a bunch of pound defines, which effectively turn pixel shader syntax into our syntax for the most part. So if we were to just paste this in here, uh, with the exception of maybe the fact that they, uh, uh, that, you know, I, I don't know why that, I'm surprised it accepted that 2.0 F. I don't think it's supposed to allow that. Um, I should probably get rid of that. Uh, that must be just being accepted by the shader because we're using a later shader model uh, or something, but earlier shader models wouldn't have liked that, I don't think. Uh, but anyway, with the exception of a few things like the fact that these should be F uh, listed or whatever there, right? Um, effectively, when we're doing the lighting, you know, what we want to do is basically this. Now, we don't necessarily want to do exactly this. There's going to be some changes to it probably. Uh, and we probably want just pure diffuse reflection and, and so on and so forth. But for the most part, what we want to do is almost exactly the same thing that we were doing in the pixel shader. So very, very similar. And if you look at what that means for us, really, this is the problem. So it's really just these texture lookups. Those are the things that we don't really know, right? Uh, and so we want some way of emulating what the texture unit on the graphics card is doing in our CPU code. And that's what we have to write today. All right, so what we want to do is focus on this and start here. We know we want to sample uh, this normal and we want to sample uh, this position, right? So we're trying to find the incoming radiance at that point. Uh, we know that we can do some of these things the same, but some of them we don't really want to do. So if you look at what's happening here, right, this is part of doing reflection for things that might have specularity or like a reflective component to them uh, that has to do with the angle of view. Since we're moving light around a scene um, at the moment, I don't know that we really want that. Uh, maybe we do. I mean, you could argue that that is kind of how it should be working, that we should still be taking this into a, a account uh, in terms of specular reflection. So, you know, maybe that's true. And maybe we want to leave that in there. I don't know. If that's the case though, what we need to know uh, when we do compute voxel radiance is we don't really want world P minus camera P. That is saying what light is gonna be reflected back to the viewer. And remember, that's fine for computing what the visible pixels color should be when we're looking at it. But what we would wanna do if we wanted to simulate specularity in a bounce like this, is we wanna know what the query ray is. So effectively what we want here is like an input, uh, you know, an, an I parameter there, right? That's gonna give us that information back. And arguably what we probably should have done here is sent that in. And the reason that I say that um, is because if you look at uh, the, the um, get radiance, or sorry, the compute uh, voxel function here, uh, this maybe should have got passed into this anyway, uh, because, you know, maybe you want to sample it from more than one direction for some reason or something, you know, but anyway. Uh, so we have like an incidence here, which is like the out, you know, the outgoing uh, direction or whatever. And it, it's really the incoming direction. You can see it's world P minus camera P. So it's the, it's the you know, in pointing direction. Uh, so this is like the incidence, I guess we'll call it. Uh, and so if we want to do that, what we need is, is we just need someone to pass that into us and tell us like what direction were you trying to sample, right? But once we have that, then we have all the same information that we needed here. So we can pretty much do everything that we needed to do, right? We can compute that R value. This stuff is what we'll have to change a little bit just to make sure that we're computing the uh, voxel information the same way. But basically that is what we want. We're then going to ask the light sampler to give us back this information. And since we know that we're not sampling fours, we can actually just change this to be effectively sampling threes everywhere because we don't have this. This isn't encoded, right? So we don't actually have to do that either. We can just sort of do this uh, in a simpler way. Right? So we can do this. This would sample all of the things uh, that we have there. And then when we compute the light data here, uh, that's the outgoing uh, light data that we're going to sample, uh, we can pretty much just capture all of that information uh, as we go, right? So if we do that, all we would have to do is, uh, you know, emulate now the get radiance call. It would be passed the, the light information and the reflectance here. Uh, so that information would come out here and you can see it's going to do literally just exactly this call, uh, this code rather. 
The only difference is the light value here can actually be the light color directly. So that information doesn't have to be uh, sort of, uh, I don't know what the word you want to use is, decoded, I guess, like it does have to be in the pixel shader. So that light color here, this stuff doesn't have to happen because we just have the actual light unencoded. So this would work directly uh, and the rest of this would not have to be, uh, you know, nothing special would have to happen here. So basically this exact code path should actually be fine. Uh, and what we want to do now is just kind of uh, work through it and get it uh, implemented exactly. Now you can see here that the world normal is not uh, present here. That's because that was coming in as a global effectively in the pixel shader, right? And so this sample n that we have here is actually the, the information that we need for that. So we kind of need to do something more, more along these lines where we're gonna pass that in as another parameter that wasn't getting passed here. So that value is, is varying now and we have to make sure that that gets uh, taken care of here. But other than that, I think we're good. So there's the sampling code for that uh, irradiance there. And then we're just working on this part. So world P we know it's just sample P, right? And so really the, the majority of the problem now, it just comes down to this piece of code here that we don't really know. And, oh, and also uh, this is really just result now, right? Okay. So now we have a sketch of the routine and what you can see is that really, like I said, pretty much everything translates almost exactly. So we don't really have to do anything um, to, to modify the math. It's, it's almost exact, right? We just had to wire up uh, the parameter coming from the, the function parameter rather than uh, from sort of a global in the shader because the shader is sort of its own function that gets called, if you will. Uh, and global variables are really just parameters to it in that context. So what we want to do now is say, well, the compute voxel irradiance at function just now had the, the work that we don't have uh, is we need a way to sample the voxel uh, using the same kind of trilinear filtering uh, that the game itself would use, right? And, and so if I want to do something like that, what I need to do is just take like the texture call here and implement the same thing that the graphics card would have done and what you can see is it's a little bit squinky because we sort of have the that light voxel is not stored as a separate thing, right? But that's actually good in our case because we don't really want to belabor the point here. Uh, so what we probably want to do is make these just get sampled directly in here uh, as something that can be done from the the you know the neighboring uh, voxels. So if I look at how we've got our voxels stored, they're in one of these uh, light computation, uh, uh, sorry, light voxel cell. Oh, this, this doesn't exist anymore. I don't know why that's, that's a vestigial remain. Um, so this light voxel cell here, if we look at the way that it's laid out, uh, what we can see is we've got all the information that we need right here. So we really just need our eight voxel, you know, our eight voxel cells, right? That's what we would need here. And we need a way of grabbing those cells, uh, sort of getting the, getting the ones that surround a particular location. So we know that we can find an exact location, right? But what we don't know is how to get the things around an exact location, right? So if you look at get voxel index, for example, you can see here, right? This, this call right here tells us, uh, you know, the first piece of information that we need. I don't know why that, there we go. Uh, so we know part of it, right? We know that if we did this, this world P here, where if we ask for sample P, uh, this gives us our voxel index here, right? So if we do, oops, I don't know why. I'm like typo king this morning. There we go. Uh, so this right here would give us the voxel index that the sample P itself lies in. And then of course we need to know ones that are sort of on uh, one away in each case for this, right? And the key thing here, the thing that's, pro that's a problem for us is we need to know, we need to be able to clamp. Right, so we need to be able to say like, look, if we're gonna, we don't wanna fetch outside this voxel. So when we're doing the fetching, we need to be able to clamp our fetches so that they all end up inside. Um, I'm gonna put that in a sort of simple function for now. And you know, we probably have to speed this routine up. This is probably gonna be the slowest part of our code is doing this lighting sample here. That'd be my guess anyway. And so we're probably gonna have to do work to make this cleaner and not do it the way that I'm doing it here. But just to, so you're clear on it, 
I'm gonna do the simple version first, and then we're gonna worry about the speed part uh, after everything is working. So in here, what we'll do is first do the, the light voxel cell. And I'm just gonna go ahead and take a, a sort of the, the literal version of this. You know, we've got, uh, you know, a, a, an eight, eight cell region. We've got two by two by two. We're trying to get uh, basically the, the things that we would need to interpolate between. When we get the voxel index here, we're gonna assume that we adjust this downward. So for example, normally when we get in voxel index, we just wanna know which voxel index you're in. But in this case, we're going to need to do something where we say, okay, if you were on one side of the voxel, you would do a different thing than if you were on the other side of the voxel, right? So I'm gonna assume that we handle that first and we're gonna uh, sort of deal with, with uh, that flooring in a, in a different way. In fact, I, what I could do here is, is literally just put this code in here because we're gonna to need to work with it in a second. So this is where we need to start off, right? And before we do, or after, I guess maybe we, I should say, after we do this floor, this F chord here, we're gonna produce the UVWs for this thing uh, by subtracting these, right? So after we've done the floor, where we are inside the voxel that we're actually in, um, that information, well, and you know what, I guess the other thing we could say is, we kind of need to know relative to the voxel center as well. So there's a bunch of information we need to, to do here actually. So if we take this F chord, what you can see here is we're producing the voxel cell we're in by doing this, but what we really want to know is the voxel that we would be in. I'm having so much trouble explaining this. I think we just need a diagram. I know what I want, but I'm not able to say the words that's, uh, uh, that, that's going to make it clear. So we're just going to take that as a sign that we need the diagram. So here's, Here's our voxel sample. So what we wanna do here is we wanna say, all right, we know that we're trying to produce effectively this. Right? We have like this voxel. We know that it's going to be a little cube and it's divided up such that we have eight little cells, right? And we know that if we imagine, you know, our sort of X, Y, Z here, that like this is the minimum corner, right? And this is the maximum corner in terms of coordinates. And so what we wanna do is we wanna produce this minimum corner value, and then we wanna do like plus one in every dimension and every combination of dimension to produce our eight cell indices. Now to produce this, the thing that I wanted to point out, and I'll draw the diagram in a simpler form over here, we'll just do a 2D cross section because it works the same in any number of dimensions. We have the center of a voxel cell, and that is where we're assuming these values exist, which honestly may have been a mistake. Maybe we should have assumed that they work at the vertices because this would have worked a lot better if we'd done that. Uh, so, so there's that. Um, but again, you know, there's, yeah, we'll see. We can adjust it later if we need to. So what we want to do here is just say, look, uh, we know that this is where our voxel information is stored. And so if, you know, you imagine this is 0.5, uh, 0.5 along, you know, uh, from, say, the, the corner of this voxel, which would be here, right? Uh, if this is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 along, what that means is that if you were below 0.5, so if you were only like 0.2 uh, above this line, you would actually want your minimum corner to be this voxel. And the reason is because the things you're going to be blending between are actually these four. Whereas if you were up here and you considered this, you would use these four, right? So what we want to do here is include that 0 0.5, 0 0.5 bias when we compute the actual value. So in here, where we do this Hadamard product, right? And we do the inverse voxel cell dim to figure out basically where we're at. What we need to do is we need to then say, let's shift those, let's shift that value downward uh, by the 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so that we get a different clamping uh, than we otherwise would, right? So in this right here, once we've done uh, this, you know, moved it into voxel space, what we wanna do is basically shift over by a, a, a bias factor to move us into 
the previous voxel if that was where we should have been. Then when we do the floor, we're producing the value we actually wanted, and uh, we can now do the subtraction off of that value should give us the proper UVW for blending, whereas before uh, it would not have done that because we were in a shifted space relative to where we want it to be, I believe. That's my assertion anyway. So in order to get the fractional part here, I can actually just do the opposite. I can take the vox cell dim and multiply it here. So I can do the opposite Hadamard, basically. So like this. Right. So this will give me my UVWs. Uh, and so now I know like relatively where I am. Uh, and that should always be well behaved. Right. Now, the problem that we're going to have here is we're, we, this voxel index is potentially out of bounds as well, right? So we need to make sure that that gets clamped properly. But I think other than that, I think we should be okay, right? Uh, the clamping will happen in here. So this UVW gives us the UVW blend that we need. And so then what we can do is we don't need this anymore because this code is what we just implemented up here, but for our scheme, right? Uh, and perhaps we should also put this down here because that's something that has to do with the lighting and we maybe don't want to uh, make it look like that's part of the voxel lookup information because it's not. So what we're going to do then is we're going to uh, get our voxel light cells here. Uh, so we'll just grab a pointer to each of those and say, all right, where are those? And this will be like, uh, you know, uh, look up voxel clamped or something like that. Uh, and we're going to say, here's the voxel index X, voxel index Y, voxel index Z, uh, like this. And that way we can say, all right, look up each of these things, and we're going to get these out in the order that we would expect them, right? So first we would say X, then we would say X plus one, right? For each of these, like so. Uh, and then we would say, okay, uh, then it's going to be Y plus one potentially. Oops. Did I do one? I did. There we go. I only need eight of them. Uh, and then finally the Z plus one on the outside. Right. And so as you can see, all I'm doing here is taking every possible combination. If I space these out, you could see maybe a little bit better what I'm talking about, but we're just incrementing uh, we're just doing every permutation of X, you know, down the line, uh, you know, plus zero, plus one, plus zero, plus one, plus zero, plus one. Then we're doing a, you know, the half cadence on Y and then the half again cadence on Z. And you can kind of see uh, that that just gives us all the permutations of plus zero and plus one for each of these. So that would get us all the voxels. And some of these may be the same voxel if they had to clamp, uh, but we're going to let the clamping function do that. Uh, and then once we have that, we should be able to produce all of these by just basic lerps, right? So we have a lerp function. Here it is. Uh, and so all we need to do is lerp our values. I believe we have a lerp for both uh, types. Yeah, so we, have, we can do our v3s as well. So we can just say, look, I'm going to lerp this stuff. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to go between mo uh, different cells, right? So we know we've got... Uh, cells something and then we want to take you know maybe the light n value zero or something right and then we would lerp that with cells something and that n value and that's how we would produce like the n zero right um, so that's all we really have to do and this is going to be the same for all of these it's just going to change the only thing that's going to change is what we actually lerp right uh, and which parameter we actually use to lerp it. Well, I guess, you know, it's, it's not lerp. That's, that's incorrect. I shouldn't say that. Um, <clears throat> it's actually like a cubic thing. So we probably need to do uh, our, our own thing here. Something like that, I guess. And I'll just make a macro probably that expands this out. Um, in fact, that's almost certainly what I'll do. So what I probably wanted to do here, this was probably uh, premature. Probably didn't need to do it this way. I can probably do just a macro to expand that out um, and just say 
what the what parameter we're doing, right? So I can probably just do this. And then I just need something that will do this properly, right? Okay. So what would that look like? Well, for a trialer of, you know, some field, and I guess we didn't even really need this because since we're defining the macro locally, we could just say, look, that doesn't matter. Um, <clears throat> so if we're, <clears throat> if we're defining this, we know that we can do it with the cell lookup here. Uh, and to be fair, I guess we didn't really need to do it. Uh, we probably could have made these lookup voxel clamped things actually just be, you know, cell zero 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 cell zero you know we, we didn't need it to be an array uh, that may just make it harder to read uh, so i apologize for that maybe we'll change that later but for now so we need to do a trialer uh, for a particular field what we have to do is first uh, compute the lerp uh, for each of our um, so we first need to do bilinear interpolation on each of our uh, you know, two, two halves of the, of the voxel, and then we need to do the linear between them, right? So it's basically like a series of linear blends. So the first thing that I would say is, well, all right, you know, if you take a look at that diagram that I had before, like here, so now what we're effectively saying is, look, we're sort of gonna break it down, and I guess we'll probably break it down in Z, so we'd probably do it this way. So what we're pretty much doing is saying, all right, the first thing we're gonna do is take four linear blends to produce basically these blend points. So blend these, this, this, and this, right? That gives us these four. We'll then blend those to get these, and then we'll blend those, right? So we're just making you know, a series of blends there. <clears throat> and so in order to do that, you know, first what we would do, like I said, is we'll, we'll lerp on X, so we're gonna use that first. And in order to do that, what we need is whatever the field was. So we need the cells, you know, for that field, it'll look like this, right? Uh, we need to lerp between the X's of all possible combinations, right? So we're gonna have something that looks effectively like this, where we say, look, we're gonna go from zero to one. I guess I should have put that in there first. Um, we're gonna do from zero to one on each X, every X that we have, right? And so we're going to have to do like that, I guess, right? Um, and so like I said before, there's four of these. So I don't know why I was so overzealous there. Uh, there's four of these, and that just corresponds to the different combinations that I could have done uh, in the other dimensions, right? And we're going to lurk between those. So there's our four lerps that we start with, right? And like I said, that produces those. So now what we need to do is lerp along Y. So for each Y variance, right? And you know what, I guess this is the wrong way around. It should probably be this way, right? There we go. So for each Y variant, I need to now lerp that, right? So now you can kind of see uh, how that's going. So we produce the combinations for the X's first, and then we're gonna lerp those in Y. And then finally, there's just one big lerp at the very end that does the Z combine. And so that's a trilinear. And it's trilinear because it's three linear blends. You first do your blends in one, that's the first blend. Then you do your blends in yeah, the other dimension, then you do your blends in third dimension. So it's, you know, three linear blends in a row. All right. Um, so that's, I think, all we actually need uh, to do. Uh, and now it's just a question of uh, getting rid of compilers and debugging. Uh, so for here, again, we have world P, but it's, it's sample P in ours, so that's the wrong word. Uh, and then we need vo uh, lookup voxel clamp to be an actual thing. 
Now to do look up voxel clamp, this is pretty trivial. All we're doing is we're just going to return um, the uh, light voxel cell that is at whatever location we are asked about. So, oops. Uh, so we basically have an X, a Y, and a Z, and all we're doing it going to do is literally just do this. Take whatever the um, where is our voxel? There it is. So we're gonna take whatever the cells are here and we're just gonna return the address of the ZYX cell. Um, and off we go. And if we never were gonna fetch out of bounds, that would literally be the entire routine. But we know that this can produce out of bounds results because we may be sampling somewhere where it's at the off the end of the voxel. And so what we wanna do first is just make sure that all of our values are clamped. So I believe we have a clamp for these, we do. So really this is all we need to do. We just need to feed these values uh, through the clamp first. So we know that we want uh, to clamp ourselves to large light voxel or light large voxel dim. Um, and maybe we want to do it to the hot voxel. I don't think we do though, because I think we'll allow sampling outside to old light values. Probably, I mean, maybe that's dumb, but we'll see. Um, I'll put a to-do in about that. Uh, but either way, you know, maybe we, we do, maybe we don't, but either way, all it's gonna do is change the clamp here to be uh, a different range. So it would be, you know, different parameters here and here, but otherwise it'd be the same. Uh, and so what we do is we just clamp all those values and then we do the lookup and that's it. Right, uh, and so once we have that, I think we, there looked like there was maybe a little bit more errors there though. Oops, that's, that's interesting. All right. Um, that's, that's all we should need to do. That will get us clamped values. Then we'll be able to look these up. I don't know why these are semicolons. You know, again, it was a bad morning for typos. So kind of to be expected. Uh, who knows how many typos are creeping into our code right now. Um, and it looks like maybe this is not quite balanced. Um, yep, this in the comma in two places, actually. Uh, all right, what else we got? All right, uh, so it looks like we are missing something there. Compute box radiance at, what are we missing? Oh yes, the incidence angle. So the incidence angle here is just how the light ray is coming in. And so the probe sample end is basically what that is. Um, that's the direction the light's coming in. It's just going the wrong way. Um, so, oh, no, it's not, sorry, probe, not that. Uh, sample D, T hit ray, ray, or ray direction, there we go. So the ray direction, right, we know we hit by going in that direction. So I think all we need to do is just pass that down. So, right, the ray direction here is what we actually need. Unfortunately, that ray direction is actually a bundle, right? It's four ray directions in one. And so when we're doing that voxel sample, and by the way, it brings up the fact that this voxel sampling could probably be done wide, uh, which we may want to do, uh, but you know, Um, so we probably want to do this wide and move it out into here and like basically pass in like these should all be fours, right? So we can just pass these things directly. But for now, we're actually doing an iteration. So the ray direction itself uh, is something that kind of has to be unpacked, right? So unpacking that ray direction, what we would need to do is say, all right, ray direction one equals get component. Oh, well, it's sample D out there actually. So it's, it's, it's literally just this, right? But again, we, we'd like to avoid doing that. So we're probably hoping that basically we can just widen this path um, for the most part. And then only the thing that actually does the memory lookups on the voxels would have to be done uh, sort of not wide. 
So, all right, that's how the voxel irradiance would be going. And now we can effectively run this light transport routine if we want to. The only thing that we don't really know what to do with now is like the spamming of the voxels, right? Um, we're just gonna go ahead and just call it, right? And do the best we can. So, uh, you know, we're gonna go ahead and stop doing the test cast, I think at this point, and start trying to do actual light convection. It's gonna go terribly. And we're gonna have a crap ton of debugging work. We're not gonna finish by the end of today. Um, but we're at least going to get that sort of going. Uh, and in order to do that, it's pretty pretty simple. Uh, we've got our test cast, uh, or uh, like what is it? Test cast from probes, right? So test cast from probes is just does like a fake lighting solution, right? Um, and compute light propagation is like the real light light solution. And so if you look at the way this is working, uh, what we really want to do is say, all right, this transfer here, uh, this part here that we're actually doing that. Uh, we want to keep and test cast from probes uh, is something we actually don't want to keep uh, anymore. And so what we want to do is say, all right, let's make this a switch that can either do the real light propagation or it can do the test cast from probes, right? So if I do this, we will now call call the real routine and you know it's fail spectacularly or whatever. But that's just the way we want uh, things to go. Now if I go look at uh, compute light propagation. Uh, you can see that that doesn't actually pass that. This is not real. Uh, I don't know why that was still going through there. That was just like old code. Um, but you can see that now we're going to call this thing and it's going to distribute the work out. And this is the, the multi-work case. We can also call the single work case while we're debugging. Um, but, you know, now we're, now we're actually in party zone, right? Uh, so now what we need to do is start figuring out what the heck is going on. And so we're going to switch to debug mode because, you know, if we got crashes and we got to like fix all this stuff, we should also switch to single threaded probably. So if I just, you know, do that, uh, we'll be in single threaded mode. And now when I do um, our compilation uh, in debug, we should be able to like step through the code and see what the heck is going on and so on. All right. Uh, looking in here, so our lighting work has changed a little bit. Let me just go in and, um, and make that work. So yeah, like, let's see, solution first light probe, one pass last uh, first light probe index, one pass last light probe index. Um, that's going to be light probe count. Uh, so it's basically that. And I think that should do it probably. Um, Didn't we call this compute light propagation work or something like that? Yeah, we did. So what's the function call for that platform work queue callback? Does that not look like that? So platform work queue callback looks like this. Uh, it takes the work queue and the data. So I guess we're just supposed to pass the lighting queue in here. All right. Uh, so now what we got to do is, again, just figure out what's going on with our routine. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get some information here. All right. So uh, to start with, this is not really a, a real crash. Uh, this is just we haven't quite finished writing this routine, it looks like. So we have the like end closest lights bit here. Uh, so we just never actually did that. So we should probably do that. But for right now, what we're going to do is probably not do end closest lights. We're just going to call like the get one closest light feature. Uh, and or because we only really need one uh, at the moment, right? So instead of any of this stuff, uh, you know, we're, we're going to maybe get rid of this and just say, all right, lighting box bias toward light is going to be like, what's that uh, get light leaf for P or whatever the crap it was. So this, right? Um, and we just need a p value of where we're going to actually look for it. And so since we know the point that we're going to be sampling the light probe position, uh, all we should have to do is just pass that down. Uh, and then we'll get back like the light that is, you know, nom not really closest to us, but is near to us or whatever, right? A, a light that is near to us. Um, so we can start there and then we can see what this code is actually doing and see if it, you know, we can actually get it working at all. 
Um, so now we're actually running. And so hopefully, like, if I compile in release mode, we can see. But presumably, what our problem's going to be is we're just going to remain black. There's not going to be any actual light uh, because of bugs in the in, in the uh, voxel sampler or who knows what else, right? All right. So here's where we're at. You can see that the game is running, right? And, you know, the, the hero is actually hopping around, but you can't see it. I can sort of see the faint little lines in here. Um, so what we need to do now is figure out why we're not getting any light back, right? And so what we're going to want to do is step through our, you know, our lighting function here and see what's going on. But, you know, basically we got to figure out how this, you know, makes this routine work properly. Uh, and also, you know, it should be at least injecting some transfer, uh, some light transfer in here. So I think we maybe just have some basic issues. Um, and you know, this doesn't have to happen anymore because this happens at the end. I would think. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to step through this because I don't really know what's wrong with it, right? So I want to see what's going on. Um, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to start by saying, look, we should have the bias towards light path. Uh, we should hit something sometimes, right? And the more interesting thing too, to me actually, is that if we didn't hit anything, so like, let's say you go in this path, we should be injecting some moon color, even if we didn't hit anything. So the fact that this isn't working is really weird. I'm just going to actually jump to here really quickly and see what our, what our status is for like light P. Um, light C and light fall off. Oops. Did I not recompile? All right. So here's our information. If I look at the light color, there is light coming back. So that's a bit weird. And we're going to spam the voxel. So, hmm. So the fact that the light fall off, I think that's the wrong way to go for the moonlight, right? So light fall off gets multiplied in here, I think. Yeah, times the light. Oh, no, but that should... So the lighting should be adding something here, shouldn't it? Ah, I know what's going on. So one thing we did, and we shouldn't have done it this way because it was misleading, is in the test cast from probes, we welded the part here that does the updating of the voxel into the test cast. But we need that to actually happen inside the uh, lighting always, right? That needs to happen here effectively, right? So we were never, we were accumulating stuff, but then we were never actually doing anything with the accumulated version. Um, okay, so that, that makes sense that that didn't work. So we should, because we should, even if our raycast is totally busted, we should be seeing some moonlight because that's what happens when you don't find any light sources you're supposed to just get a little bit of moonlight right um so this looks totally crazy right now i have no idea what's going on there but that's actually better at least than it was because now at least we sort of are seeing something right all right so let's run this in at full speed and see what the heck we're looking at here uh, and then we'll sort of start to try and figure out what the heck uh, what, what's going on with our with our code, right? All right. So that was just some crazy, I don't know what that was about. Uh, but anyway, so we are seeing some light so we can get started here. So let's take a look inside compute light propagation. Uh, again, we're doing this single threaded, so we shouldn't have to worry about any weird like threading things that are happening now. Uh, and if we look down here uh, where we're doing our, our light updating, right, uh, here's where we're spamming our voxels, you, you know, uh, and this should be clearing those out, 
right? So we should be seeing some something stable. Like you know, what's a little bit weird is why did it go to black? Like why did we not? Why did don't we see just a stable uh, light there? I'm not 100% sure. Uh, there might be some like nanning or something like that going on in here. But um, so you know, this code path. In fact, one thing I could do too is just maybe we just start with just trying to debug just the moon uh, the moonlight itself. So if I literally just nuke the path that ever actually does anything, right? And say, we're always gonna just do moonlight transfer. Sounds like some kind of bad 70s band. Um, if we just do moonlight transfer, like what happens there? Uh, and one thing you can see from the moonlight transfer at the moment uh, is it's a little nonsensical, the results that we're getting. I especially don't understand why moving in here changes. I don't understand why that gets darker when we move in. Oh, possibly because we are the closer light than that one was or something like that. So maybe that's not that ununderstandable. Uh, but anyway, so I'm curious like about this now, like let's try and figure out why, you know, the ambient light looks way too bright. You know, why is that? And I'm not sure. So if we take a look at how this is being spammed out here, uh, I'm not sure about the ray weight either. Is that? So we're not using the ray weight either. So we also don't, this is totally busted as well. And this is not six anymore. Um, yeah. So if we look at what's happening here, the ray bundle count is how many of these we're going to do right and so the weight of each one of these would be one over the ray bundle count um i'm not sure that that's even necessary though because we're doing a power sum here in fact you can see us doing the power sum and then we're normalizing by the total power after so i'm pretty sure that actually this just doesn't need to be here anymore um when we spam the voxel, we could just probably, uh, just looking at this, that's the average light location, the average light fall off, and then the light color, the light color is never normalized for some reason. Am I wrong about this? So we're summing the light color every time, but we never normalize that. And we probably should. So I guess maybe I spoke too soon there. So this is gonna do uh, one over the ray bundle count times the rays per bundle, right? So it's it's actually times four. And so the ray weight down here would be used to normalize this. Right? So I do think that needed to happen because these are too, this was way too bright. Uh, and I think that was why, because the color was never uh, adjusted properly. Uh, and so that should be down there, but the problem is, you know, our the way that our color encoding works is we actually sort of color encode a few steps down. Black is is below, like, uh, the actual color of no light is moved upwards by the fact that we're doing sort of that clamping of the light value, uh, that that shifting of the light value to get the interpolation. And so it's hard to say, we kind of need to work that out a little bit more, but for now we'll boost our light bios. Eventually we're gonna have to go through and work out exact, the exact math on that to get it just right. Um, 
but basically what that means is like yeah this has to be sort of shifted into a range that actually produces some visible light there uh once we do that truncation and i'm not sure what that value would necessarily be uh but we can play with it and figure out what it should be second here Just need to figure out roughly where we think that that ambient should be at. So it's somewhere right in there, it looks like. So one thing that's really kind of strange, though, is I'm not quite sure why we're getting different values depending on where you are. I mean, this is an ambient light. It should be added into everybody, right? And so I guess I'm not sure where that's coming from. That seems concerning. Like, why would my location ever change that information? Because we're not actually doing anything with, like, we're not... We if zeroed out the case that actually happens when you hit a light source. So, in, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, is emission direction... So I guess... <clears throat> I guess that bias does come in... Hmm... Yeah, I'm not sure what we want to do about that. What we would need to do here for emission direction, so a couple things about this. If you look, like, that is one place where that thing would have needed to be normalized, and currently it's not. So if we actually look at what's going on uh, with that initial ray direction here, that's not normalized and, and pretty much does need to be, right? Uh, so that's a bit of an issue. Yeah, that's a bit of an issue. So what we would want to do here, I guess, uh, let me just take a look at what we've got here. Proxnos. So I'm going to do a ray direct, you know, I'm going to do an approxnos on it. Um, and that would normalize it so that we wouldn't be getting wildly different results for uh, rays that are, you know, pointing directly upwards versus, one, oops, versus ones that aren't. Um, so I'm assuming that would allow us to deal with this now more stably. But again, there may be some other bugs in here. All right. So to me, that looks pretty moonlighty, you know? Um, again, I'm not really sure exactly what's going on with some of this stuff. It looks like there's still some weirdness in terms of what's getting, like, why is that? I guess that might be just because things that haven't been pulled in yet take a while to relight at that slow of a speed. which I guess is going to be a problem for us, but. All right. So I'm not sure. I think we still have some bugs in there, but I'm going to just push forward. Again, I know this is going to be a long process, so as, as much as it is annoying, I'm just going to go ahead and say, all right, Let's try and get as far as we can. This should blow up now, in theory, uh, because like we know something is crazy about it. 
and the way that those are kind of flashing like that, uh, I believe that means we're getting some kind of nanness in there. Like I think we're getting some invalid values somehow. Uh, somebody is returning garbage or like F32 max, right, or something. So you know maybe that's you know maybe that's this, right? Um, I don't know. But anyway, so somehow I think we're getting some garbage values in there. I'm not sure exactly how. Uh, I'm not sure why that would be exactly. And I don't think there's anything weirdly like uninitialized or anything. So I'm not sure why we would be getting weird values here because you would think um, that this all should have been reasonable. And looking at like, so, you know, we're getting the probe sample out of this. We're getting the normal here. We're getting the color out here and the emission value. Um, So, you know, I guess just looking at this, I'm just going to say, like, maybe the easiest thing to do is to just try and say, well, the only stuff that really comes out of here um, that's particularly strange, I mean, I guess light P, what happens with light P? Probe sample P. So probe sample P is moon P, and then in here we would compute it as get component subray. All right, so basically like, this is the only stuff we actually ever see. So probe sample P, transfer PPS, and this light fall off. This light fall off is 0.5 here and zero here. So like the chances that that's causing a, a significant nanish kind of problem are like zero, unless we were dividing by this light fall off which we know we're not, and also that's the case that works, right? So I think we're looking at transfer PPS and light P uh, must have bugs in them somehow. So let's take a look at them and say like, you know, if inbounds or uh, looks fishy, right? I'm going to just make this function called looks fishy and I'm going to pass these two things to it. Uh, like give myself a way to get uh, a breakpoint in to see if some of these values are weird. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a function called looks fishy. Uh, and again, this is just to aid uh, debugging here, right? So basically what that's going to do is it's going to return if you pass it in some kind of a vector. Uh, it's going to return a result that, like, if this vector looks kind of fishy, um, it's going to say true. So what I'm going to say here is looks fishy x. And I'm just going to make a looks fishy for a scalar. And then that's all I really need, right? And I'm going to say this, this scalar looks fishy. Uh, you know, if, uh, if a dot x, uh, I want it to kind of be inbounds, right? So I want a dot x to be greater than or equal to like negative something large and a dot x, oops, not a dot x, just a. Right, so I just want to, you know, have some way of testing this thing and finding out like roughly whether these values are in bounds at all. Um, and I'm gonna change this to debug mode. And I'm hoping what'll happen is we'll just get a breakpoint there uh, and we'll be able to see that some of our values are just getting, you know, uh, in just totally busted. That's the hope. Um, so let's see. 
So here we are, and uh, we know that we're, you know, the, the folks we're looking at here, let me get rid of this, we don't need any of that now. Uh, let me look at transfer PPS and light P. So here's those values. Uh, transfer PPS looks fine. Uh, light P, I mean, is that really plausible? I mean, technically that value is not ridiculous, but it does seem like that would be kind of weird. Uh, that the light position could really be that far away. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, is light P actually valid? So light P in this case... Oh, that's the summation though. It's, it's sorry, so it shouldn't be light P, it's probe sample P. Sorry, sorry. We're looking at the wrong value. There is nothing wrong with that. Uh, so let's let it run a little more here and see if anything uh, looks fishy. We're hoping it does. Okay, good. So we're getting it looks fishy here. Let's see what the actual things we get are. So that, I mean, uh, oh, again, looking at the wrong one. So that's ridiculous. So yeah, like it looks like, I guess there's no immediate like nanning involved, but it does look like our light values are feeding back on themselves. Like we're putting light into the system uh, and it's just like driving out to, it, it's just getting like an infinite amount of light, like way too much light. Like we're not properly averaging in the amount that should be averaged in or something like this, right? So something weird is happening when we're actually producing, when we're doing the spam voxels, like this stuff is not computing something stably uh, or something. The transfer PPS is just way too high. And so normally what, what's happening here, I guess, is, is we're doing that by taking the sample ref color uh, I'm assuming that's coming from here because presumably sample ref color uh, should should never really be particularly high. I mean, maybe it is coming back badly, but I, I would like to see. So let's set a breakpoint in here where we actually get a hit and see about how much light we're sending back. So let's see, we've got a pro, well, sorry, we've got um, voxel irradiance here. Uh, here's our trilinear filtering. That's our light in zero. Light in one. All right. Let's see zero. Yeah. So this should just produce no light at all. It does. And so at first, this looks like it's working okay. I guess we don't really know, like if this was going to be something that actually hit a light source and the emission value came back, then we're going to actually put something in there, right? Um, But again, I don't really see that being particularly bad. Let me take a look in here. I, I don't remember what we're doing inside spam voxel. I'm not seeing anything really all that suspicious yet, which is not good. The more subtle it is, the worse, right? So if we go in here and take a look at what's happening, uh, this is just filling in the light field. Uh, And this is kind of, yeah, so this is kind of broken. Um, so spam voxel slice, yeah, is, is already accounting for the intensity range of the light source here. So that is not actually the way we would want to do it. So spam voxel slice probably has to be changed a little bit. Um, and that fall off has to be more of an like this this needs to be about the actual fall off because the emission 
rate has already been put in there. And so the light A actually should just be going like, you know, between like zero and one really. Um, so, so that's not, it's not really what we wanted, right? Um, so let me fix that first. Uh, let's just let's just try and fix that one part, and uh, and we'll see what happens. So if this actually was not going to do that, and we were just going to use the light df instead, uh, so this would just do a fall if it wouldn't do the light intensity boosting like it was doing there before. <clears throat> uh, I'm just curious what we end up with now. Again, I think it's still broken. I don't think this will actually fix it, um, but I'm just curious if we can now sort of isolate a different portion of the code as being busted as opposed to just that, which was feeding back like very large values. Right. And again, not really sure what's going on here. Still pretty weird, right? Like, I just don't even know exactly how we're getting that because since these voxels are supposed to be kind of smoothed over time, it's like those must be really huge values that are like coming in and out of there, right? So we're still in like real bizarro land, uh, just producing like crazy fully crazy values and I guess we don't really know whether it's you know it could be crazy in in multiple ways it could be crazy because the normal is really weird or it could be crazy um, because the color is really weird and one thing we probably do want to do is normalize our normals the fact that our normals aren't normal is a little weird so like for example um, when we're doing like the spamming of the voxels and then we do, you know, we accumulate the normals. Accumulating the normals shouldn't actually renormalize them using the normal value. It should renormalize them using normalization because you want a, your normals to be normal. You don't want them to just be an average because that could produce pretty much anything really. So I suppose we also should probably do an end lighting computation where we do this. What we should probably do is say, yeah, this part, um, where you blend these two together, after that, you want to actually do a normalization, right? So here you'd want to do this. Um, and again, I don't really think that has much to do with anything at the moment, but it just occurred to me that like, we want our normals to always be normal. We don't want them to be averages. Uh, and so off we go. Now, in theory, if the normals are always normal, in theory, that would mean that the color values are the thing that's wrong right now, because we know that they're always normal. Um, really hard to say. When we're looking at this here, I also wonder to what extent we need to do clamping. Like, so when we output the voxel and we do light C0 output here, how is that getting encoded? So these don't look like they're maybe being clamped correctly either. So when the light I value comes in, it could be between zero and whatever, right? Um, and 
And I guess I don't know. So, but it looks like it's taking the maximum value. So whatever the highest value is, and then it's like normalizing these down, right? So it seems like in theory, that should mean that these are always reasonably behaved. You know what I mean? Because whatever the highest value is, I mean, I guess, you know, they could be, if somehow they got to be negative, uh, which would be pretty ridiculous because we're only ever adding values in. Um, but no matter what the highest value actually is, I would think it should be okay. Because this will always knock it back down. Right? So I don't really see any way that could really overflow. So I'm not sure, again, I'm not sure where the flickering could possibly come from. Um, let's go ahead and do some testing. So when I do the transfer, suppose that I was to stop transferring uh, the normals altogether, and I just said, look, you know, the normal is always gonna be the same or something, right? Uh, so when we actually do the, where does that go? So down here, when we actually pack the binormal to normal here, uh, and we do, you know, the packing of these things down, what if I just said like, look, it's always just like Z or something, right? So, so now like I've taken that out of the equation and when we run this, we should always have stable normals, like always, right? Um, and so there's what our, our result looks like. And then similarly, like what if I leave the normals the same and always output the same color? So like, okay, the color value is just always gonna be like gray or something. Um, <clears throat> or maybe, it, just remember this is, Sort of a weird irradiance pack thing. Oh, right, I have to do an irradiance pack on it. So, this. So let's suppose I just put in some kind of stable value here that's always gonna be the same. And I don't know what that value would be, but it's like, you know. Say that gray. Uh, and now if I just tweak with those, what do I get? So, all right, we're radiance packing some values here. I don't actually know what these need to be. This is probably part of the encoding stuff that we now have to go start working out more directly to because you know we now have problems all over the place. It's like pretty hard for us to know exactly what is what here. So how high does this have to be to actually produce visible? I don't know, I don't remember what our max light uh, intensity is here. Why do we have two of those? Okay, there we go. Um, So that's really bizarre too, right? So like, if that's, is that from the normals? So if I now pack a normal in, that go away? So there is weirdness coming in from both places, basically, right? So, if I pack the actual normal, it's weird too. Like somehow the normal to the light that's getting computed for all of these probes is like, I guess downward or something. Something that's creating a pure black there. Uh, like, I don't know, right? Like, but you can see that that's purely coming from the normal. So I suppose we can kind of break this into two separate problems. One is that we're outputting weird information for the color, and one is that we're outputting weird information for the normal. Yeah. 
it would seem. Right? Hmm. So I'm not sure how to proceed now. We've got a lot of stuff to debug. I'm not sure what the best way to do it would be. But there we see very you know, clearly uh, that we're getting kind of weird values coming in uh, so presumably like here where we're spamming this information and we sort of have what the light position is that stuff is coming from, um, you know, that, that value is getting set to something very weird by the Raycaster and we don't really know why uh, that's happening. You know, I also realized too, we're going to have to do a little bit of work when we multi-thread this because uh, we can't just sum into a voxel because we don't know who is doing which part of which voxel. So we're going to have to break it up. Instead of by light probes, we're going to have to break it up by voxel region, which is a little bit of a pain in the butt, but that's just how it is. Um, So there's another thing that I think that maybe we should be doing here, which is that when we do our spamming, I wonder if we should really be doing that a little bit differently too, which is to say that we may want our light probes to not quite do that, right? We may want our light probes to, um, I think this, probably doesn't want to do what it's doing. I think we probably just want to spam just the voxel that we're in. And then we want to just do like a flood fill probably on the voxel later. Uh, so this is probably bad too. So let's take this one step at a time. Uh, I'm going to say that maybe we want spam voxel slice to actually just be the only thing we call. So I'm going to say like maybe we don't do this. And we'll add a flood fill to flood fill outward. So maybe it would look more like this. Uh, and I think we want to probably take it one step at a time, but I do think like yeah, so the, you know, the, the flood filling to fill in, what we probably want to do is make sure we have enough light probes that we don't have any problem with filling in uh, data in the general case. And then when we get to the edges, we can flood fill our voxel for people who didn't get any samples. Uh, we can just flood fill our voxel from there, right? But I do think we want to, like, get away from having to do all that spamming, right? I think that's probably a bad idea. All right, so moving on, it's weird, like it's getting close to being good, right? Um, but yeah, so I think we do want to fix that one part. And let's also, while we're at it, let's fix the test case now as well. So I'm going to go to the test cast. Call it again. Test cast from probes. So in test cast from probes, I'm going to go ahead and test cast from probes. I'm going to enable that again. And we have to fix the light intensity there. We have to output a different light intensity because the light intensity we're outputting won't be sufficient, right? Um, so if we do test cast from probes, so here is the test cast from probes version, not using the flood fill, right? Uh, and actually, there's surprisingly few things that actually fail when you're not when you're not doing that. Um, you can see a couple, right? Um, but they're surprisingly few. So it does look like we have a dense enough sampling. 
uh, of light probes to not have too many artifacts at the immediate moment. So that's all right. Hmm, hmm, I say. All right, so the fact that that is doing what it's doing there, right? Uh, if we go down and look at the, you know, that, that was always packing in uh, a, a fixed color, but packing in a normal here. So I guess, you know, yeah, and maybe I should fix this part first too. Oops. So let me go ahead and put in a switch for this so we can do either one. So that nerfs the uh, color value. And so if I want to, now I can just like switch between those two and say, all right, let's not nerf the color value. Let's actually look at what the test case was outputting for the color value. Cause that maybe that's why it looked like it was okay. It's cause the color value was getting stuffed, right? Oh, and that doesn't need to be packed. Uh, so I'm gonna try that and just see what happens there too, because I think we'll see more gaps now in theory, um, but maybe not, we'll see. Yeah, okay. So also now the intensity is wrong as I thought it should be. Okay, good, good, good. So let's go to test cast from probes and increase the light intensity. So this right here, you know, I don't know what the light intensity should be. So we'll make something up at the moment. Um, there we go. Um, So it does seem like that light fall off there is pretty steep, right? And you can see that it shifts around to follow me. And I, I don't know, is that just because of the intensity? I'm not sure, but let's find out. I'm just gonna increase the intensity here. And see what happens. So we'll reload the code. There is an increased intensity, so less fall off. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just seeing a lot of stuff that, that seems questionable, right? Um, you know, some of it makes perfect sense. Some of the stuff that you see there is just because we're only casting to that one light source. So, you know, a, a fairer test would be instead of doing this, we should probably always just be testing with that. Um, because otherwise it just doesn't really mean anything. So this, let's just go to testing, casting from just a single light source and now we know where it is, right? Um, but if we look at what's happening there, I'm still not sure it makes really any sense what I'm seeing. Um, I mean, maybe it does, but I don't know. So if we take a look at, at uh, how that's shifting. No, I, I guess that does, I guess that does look okay. Because inside, you know, there's no, there's, the voxels up here get nothing because we're not flood filling them, right? So you only get whatever you can see from this light source. Um, and probably, you know, maybe that's a little bit laggy on the light source. So, you know, maybe let's suppose we change the light preservation uh, to something like about twice as fast.
Still maybe a little bit much. I guess that was way more than twice as fast now that I think about it. That was many times faster. So this is about 10 times faster. And that seems better, right? All right, so I think I want to maybe, because I think like uh, we're going to need another weekend of debugging for sure, I'd like to take a look at flood filling the voxel perhaps, um, and maybe doing some things with the encoding. How much time do I have? I have a half an hour. Um, because our encoding was pretty ad hoc, maybe we need to like tighten that up a little bit and then get the flood filling into the correct place, because I feel like there's too many variables right now. Um, and so trying to debug... Uh, you know, any particular one of them seems, you know, sort of not possible, right? So let's suppose we move to a direct voxel fill like we're doing here, and then we flood fill to get our edges proper, right? So that the fall off around the edges where light stops uh, in the voxel looks okay, right? Um, and that again can just be done like sort of with a filter, uh, I think, after the fact. Uh, I hope that's my that's my hope anyway, uh, and and in theory we should be okay. All right. So the first thing I think we want to do is try and get the encoding into a good state, and and what I mean by that is like right now, like the normal encoding is pretty simple. It's just a directional field, right? So we don't really have to think too hard about that. We don't really know how to blend them because we don't know how to produce more than one. Like if we only have one light source, then it's pretty simple. But assuming we have like hundreds of light sources and we want to uh, simulate those 100 by projecting down onto four light fields. How we do that, I'm not exactly sure, right? Because you kind of have a K clusters problem at that point. Uh, and it's not clear how you do an incremental K clusters on this sort of thing. Uh, you know, maybe it turns out to be simple. I don't know. I'll have to look at it. Uh, but we're talking about the colors. There is an encoding issue there. And the encoding issue is just how do we want to reproduce sort of the um, stuff where we get beyond zero, right? So really what I'm talking about is this right here. So encoding so that that works properly requires you to have effectively like negative light value. So when your light fall off would end and you're going like past that, you need to still have those, you need to still have real values there, right? You can't just clamp to zero. Uh, that's not going to cut it. So what we need uh, for the interpolation because we need an encoding that has effectively like, you know, you've heard of headroom in audio recording. Well, this is the opposite. This is tail room, right? Uh, we effectively need something where, where we do our radiance pack um, on here. What we kind of need to do is figure out effectively um, sort of how we want to shift this light information around uh, such that it actually has, you know, for lack of a better uh, term, tail room. And the way I think we would probably want to do that is to let our light values go negative so that in the actual um, in the actual code paths in on the CPU side, we know that zero means no light and that negative means that we're extending our understanding of light into sort of regions where there's no light, but we want to capture how the fall off would have gone. Uh, and so I think what we want to do is, is create a definition here where that's going to be valid, right? Um, so I think what I'd do is I'd say when the light value comes in, uh, I would then uh, say that we need to clamp these values uh, and when we do the irradiance pack on them, we want to first scale ourselves up a little bit to allow for a little bit of negative light. So if I go to the Z bias program here and we look at how that's you know playing out, you can see where we do the light unpack, it's here, right? Uh, and this is not what we want, right? That's a perfect halfway split point. So that's basically saying um, we're going to 
bisect the range and have you know intensity on one side be about the same as intensity on the other. So the, the, the dark areas get as much as the, the light areas. Uh, and I don't think we want that. So I think what we want instead is something like this. We would say, first of all, let's take the light and boost it by our floor value, right? So like we would have like a light floor or something, right? And this uh, light floor value is just gonna be like how much, uh, you know, it's, it's a vector that says how much light exactly um, we have to work with in this case. So it, it, how much light we have underneath black, underneath no light. And again, that's just for keeping the interpolation working. We need values down there. So the light floor value in this case, you know, is going to be something like this. And I don't know what we should call that. Light floor value is not the greatest name. But suppose we did something like that, right? So we were just like, look, uh, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 or something is how much room we have there. Or maybe we do something that's trying to be a little bit more power of 2e, right? Um, and so you have some range, but mo most of your range is the visible light, and then only a little bit is the dark light, um, because we're just going to assume that the falloff rate is not such that we need to capture these huge values as we step out into the voxels. We don't need it to be that precise of an interpolation, so we're just not going to assume we need that much tail room there. So when the light comes in, the first thing we would do is shift it up by the floor value so that we have basically as much as we can in the actual visible space. Uh, and then we would just do like a, a clamp. And I don't know if we can clamp a vector. It looks like we can. Yes. Um, so we wouldn't really want to clamp zero to one necessarily, but we would want to do that a little later on. So uh, I guess then what we would do is we'd take the maximum of all of these things. Uh, I guess we do really want to clamp it here, though. So I'm going to do a clamp uh, of the max light intensity value here. Right? I guess all we really need to do is just clamp the zero end, actually. So I think all we really need to do here is say, look, um, I think that's all we really need to do. I don't think we need to clamp in the other direction. So we just need to clamp things that are so negative that they would be underneath the light floor, right? So we first shift up by the light floor value, then we clamp to make sure that we're within that range. We now know that nothing can be negative. We take the maximum value, we normalize out by that. If it was greater than the maximum intensity, that's okay. This will take care of it, uh, this clamp right here. Uh, and then we encode the light. So then in the pixel shader, when we actually need to deconstruct this, then we're not actually doing this anymore. So what we're doing instead is we're saying, well, um, we have an A value that we use to encode uh, the light for maximum intensity. Um, so we're gonna multiply that out first. So here we would say, uh, this clamp doesn't need to happen, I don't think. Uh, so I think what we want to do here is say, all right, um, we're going to take the max light intensity multiplied by the actual intensity of the light that we encoded, and then mu multiply that by the actual uh, uh, light floor, the actual lighting values. And then that gives us back the value that we actually encoded in the first place. But we know that that's been shifted up slightly by the light floor value. So then what we need to do is like remove that light floor value. Um, and that will shift us back down into the negative range. Then we just color things as we normally would, right? So then the light floor value actually does have to be uh, in there somewhere. And so when we actually output the pound defines for this thing, we're probably gonna have to put that in there, right? So we're gonna have to do like, you know, our light floor value has to get put in here. And that's just something that's gonna come, uh, 
in fact, I guess we don't even have to quite do it that way. It would really just be like this. Well, no, I'm going to have to make a string out of that somehow. You know what I can do? Here's what I can do. Right, then the light floor value is a thing that we can uh, put in here as a percent %f, just like we do everything else. Uh, and so then when we do all of this stuff, we can just say like light floor value goes there, right? Uh, and then inside the shader, when we actually need to produce that light floor value, we can uh, just put the subtraction in um, right here. Now, I still don't really know if that's the best way to do that, but something like that. And then we would put the light floor value uh, pound define over with max light intensity. Uh, so it ends up, you know, making some sense there. Uh, and then hopefully that sort of works. So that's now a different encoding of the lighting and hopefully that makes it easier for us to work with this stuff. Uh, so it won't be so ridiculous all the time. Um, now, I don't actually know, uh, but hopefully that will help, right? Because now it's just, it's just sane, it's more sane, right, uh, what we're looking at. Okay. Um, so looking at the test here, it looks like it roughly works. You can see that when we do the encoding, you get values that kind of shift. I assume because we just don't have enough precision in the light uh, information itself we get a lot of flickering from that. And it's kind of an unfortunate source of flickering. It would be nice if we didn't have that. So I do wonder if that means we want these values to be more, um, we're, we just need more resolution, right? Uh, we just need more resolution in the, in the light uh, intensity value, right? And so in order to, f to oh, that looks nice, kind of. Starting to look kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> and so I think we also kind of have a separate problem here that maybe we should fix. Uh, that's just like the encoding isn't enough bits, right? Like the, the encoding needs to be like 16 bits or something. Or we need to encode the, you know, we can encode the RGB one way, but, you know, like maybe like a YUV or something where we have 16 bits for the alpha for the intensity value and then just like two things for the color or something like that, right? Um, so we could try to do something like that, like, you know, use a different lighting space like log UV or something like that. I don't want to do that yet because I think that, it, again, introduces yet more parameters into the system that we have to then wrestle with. So I think what I'd rather do is figure out if we can get a cheap way here to make, <coughs> to me. Uh, make this maybe be 16 bits. So, you know, maybe, I don't know, but if we uh, were to look at how the OpenGL, it, how the texture was uh, being uh, sent down there, if we look here, right, you can see we've got um, some of the light lookup stuff. That's the normal. So here's the light uh, data here. And you can see it's uh, RGB8 and it's submitting an unsigned byte. And so I just wonder, like, you know, suppose we, we kick that up to, like, uh, an unsigned short, you know, um, and did the encoding that way. We could also use, like, half float or something like that. But I wonder, do we have those defines? We may have to copy those defines in. But if we have those defines, uh, we could then potentially, yeah, we do. Um, we could start submitting these as unsigned shorts. And if we uh, put them in as unsigned shorts, then maybe we can get a little bit more uh, out of that. So looking at the light voxel information that we're submitting there, right? So when we actually go to do the irradiance pack, uh, here, instead of doing a BGRA pack four by eight, we would actually be producing like a 64 bit value and putting that out as a result, right? And if we looked at how that would go, uh, just going down to 
uh, the where the light stuff actually gets set up. If we were to do a 64 uh, pack, it would look something like this. Uh, it would be the exact same call, right? So it's, it's really, really simple. Uh, but when we're doing this rounding uh, and we produce these values, uh, what we would want to do here is this would expand to 65535, five, five, uh, and this uh, would be packing a 64-bit value instead of a, a, a um, instead of a 32-bit value. So 16, uh, 32, 48, right? Um, so it's pretty easy for us to do something like that, and then we just have to actually like uh, record that um, that packing. What's it complaining about? Conversion from U64 to U32. Oh, sorry. There we go. Uh, and so now all we have to do is actually allocate that storage as a different kind of storage. So now like the light C, that information, that's going to be 64-bit uh, coming down. And all we're doing here is increasing the bit depth a little bit just to see to what extent we're getting uh, a problem with just bit depth information there, right? Um, and so you can see here light voxel C uh, needs to be expanded. So uh, what we're getting there is like this information, right, uh, needs to be um, 64s, right? Uh, and light data C is the same, so that's just that, right? So again, nothing really interesting happening there. I just wanted to increase the bit depth a little bit to see whether that flickering was coming from it or not, um, and I don't know. Uh, that is not what I expected even a little bit. So what did I screw up there? Did I, did I not? Oh, haha, uh, yeah. So actually we said short on the initial one, but we didn't say short on this one. Um, oops. My bad. Okay, um, so here's one that has more light bits, and I just want to see if that has anything to do with it. So I would say it's, you know, I can't even really tell if there's maybe even more there. So, you know what, I'm just going to say, uh, forget it. We're just going to send this down regular and we'll figure out the encoding later, right? So I'm going to do a to-do, uh, figure out the encoding for these later. Um, and because I don't really want to have to wrestle with that anymore. Um, because you know what, that could be the normal as well. Uh, so I'll switch both of these, uh, now we can play with them, but I'm just going to like, I'm going to let these be encoded exactly as they are, as just floats, and just say, look, we're going to, we'll figure out the encoding later when we actually care, um, but that's what we're going to do. Okay, uh, so the light voxel C in the, uh, in the platform layer here, so light voxel C uh, here. We're gonna change that to BV3s, right? And then we're just not gonna pack the values at all. We're just gonna leave them exactly as they are. So these light C values here, instead of calling a radiance pack on those, uh, we're not going to. We're just gonna do that, right? And this is just me saying, look, that was premature. We wanna see the actual values we're computing so that we know that the, the art of any artifacts that we see are not from our quantization. 
And then later when we're trying to optimize things, then we'll quantize. So that was just me being lazy because um, I didn't want to have to like add a float path there. Uh, but that's not what we want to do. And so here where we set up the, the light seas, we'll do those this way and we won't pack. And then when we do our sampling uh, in the pixel shader, we just will just use it exactly as it is, right? We won't touch it. Um, we won't change the value in any way. Um, uh, so there'll be no like packing or clamping or anything, right? Uh, and then, so in, yeah, in the Z bias program uh, where this thing uh, gets, you know, actually used. Um, I'm not, I'm gonna like nerf out this bit here and just say that whatever the light for uh, that, you know, whatever that light C came back as, uh, yeah, we're just gonna use. So I'm gonna say, uh, oops. I'm gonna say the light color equals the light V RGB and used, that's it. Uh, no modification for the light floor, no modification for anything. So then in the OpenGL code, when we submit our textures down, we're just gonna submit floats for both of them. Uh, and that's all that's gonna happen. So the uh, the 16 there, this, this one, uh, this is gonna come down as float, just like before. Uh, when we ask for how it's gonna be stored, I'm gonna ask for a float there as well. Uh, so I'm gonna see if we can just get that in both cases. Um, so not encoded uh, in any kind of shifty way there, right? And so when we do the normal, I don't know if we unpacked that. Here's the light normal. So light and ank, right, um, also got unpacked. I'm not gonna do that. So I'm gonna have that go in the same way as well. So basically all of this will just stay exactly as it was. So we get floats there, we get floats here. Um, and then I guess we also just need to make sure that where those are actually getting submitted their float, but I think we already did that. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think that's what we needed. And now everything should be kosher. When we actually pack these, uh, we would just be uh, uh, assigning them directly as well. So inside the lighting call, when we actually surface the voxel there, uh, what I'd like to do is just Make that uh, make that packing code not actually use. Um, sorry, where is that? Radiance pack. Uh, the binormal to normal thing we don't want to do anymore, right? So we want to just assign these directly. So these should be like this, uh, and off we go. And so let's try to get this working before we end for the day. So just now passing everything down as floats. So we know that like, look, it's piggy. There's probably no reason for it. Um, but at least we can start to eliminate like uh, any suspicion we have about the artifacts coming from quantization. Um, and so I think my suspicion was well-founded. So like looking at it now, it's not sparkly anymore at all, right? Um, but you can tell that it's a bad idea, right? Just looking at it currently, you, it's very slow by comparison uh, to the old ones. So you can see like those texture samplers really do cost you, right? It's not free. Um, now we can speed it back up again. It doesn't have to be slow. I'm assuming that's the graphics card. I guess I don't really know, so I should be careful there. But uh, inside our actual Z bias program, we can sample less of those, right? At the moment, we're not using a bunch of them. So if we wanted to, we could just say like, yeah, don't actually uh, do any of this, right? Just sample one of them 
and use that. And uh, that should, in theory, get us you know, that speed back if it is the graphics card that's the actual problem, right? Which I, mean, I think it was. Because I don't see, because it's it slowed down only when I'm out here, right? And so now when we look at this, right, and now it's perfectly fast again. And so I do think, you know, you can, I wasn't wrong that we need to do some encoding to keep that stuff fast, uh, but it does have a cost, right? And it looks like the cost may have been mostly in the encoding of the normals, um, not in the encoding of the colors, which is pretty interesting. But, you know, that's just something that's worth looking at, right? Uh, and so we may be able to go ahead and make color values uh, be much, much less uh, resolute, but we may need to make our normals be 64-bit uh, encoded, or maybe we change to an encoding that's like an X and a Y and then a bit for Z or something like that, right? Um, just so we can get more data out in there. So we definitely have an encoding problem. We could choose to like work on the encodings a little bit more because now we have, we know exactly like we have a, a case where we can demonstrate that it, it's perfect, no, no uh, freckling. And so we just would need some way of going, wait a minute, uh, what kind of encoding can we do here that would, that would make that work? So I'm gonna go ahead and say that's it for today. Next weekend, maybe what we'll do is get the encoding working correctly, um, but we're almost there on that. And then we can go back to the ray casting and get that working. So, you know, again, getting pretty close. Um, you know, it's, and you can see here we've got issues too. Like, so do you see how we're centering the simulation region is centered over there right now for some reason? Um, I don't really know why that's the case. Uh, so if we look at exactly what's going on there, the simulation center is, is really very far this way even though this room is not. Not actually the center. Uh, yeah, but anyway, point B, you can see how the lighting voxel probably doesn't want to be simulation center based. We probably want it to be more camera based when we move that voxel around. So that's another thing we got to do. We got plenty of stuff to do. Um, so yeah, maybe I'm also going to start here like a little list because there's a lot of stuff here. So if we go to lighting, uh, I'm going to put a little thing in that, right? Right, so that's one that we could just do next weekend. That's what we could just do, get that working, get our encoding so it's nice and smooth, and then we just don't have to think about that as a possible source of error anymore, right? So we could do that, um, or we could do that later, but either way, we can do that and figure that out, right? Uh, number two uh, would be flood fill the voxel uh, so that portions that didn't get sampled get filled in from nearby samples. So basically do a filter pass. Um, so we wanna do that, just to fill in the edges there. Um, and then what we wanna do, I think, is uh, fix the voxel centering so that the lighting hot region is always nearby to the camera so we don't see unlit areas like we are now. So I think those are some small to-dos that I just want to remember them all because they all have to happen uh, separate from going now and then in, and in fixing the light transport to be working properly because it's kind of busted at the moment, right? So we'll work on the light transport, but we also have these three and we want to do those separate. So that's what we're looking at heading into next weekend. All right, let's go ahead and go to Q&A.
Oops. Mistyped that there. Uh, where is my Discord? Mm. Yeah, okay. Remind us why you pound define internal to static. Um, so, you know, I've kind of had a slight change of mind on that, that uh, there's now like other reasons to do it than the one that I originally did. And I probably wouldn't have ch chosen the name internal. Um, so, uh, you know, six and one half dozen the other. But uh, I don't like, the word the keyword static in c and c plus plus i think it was a really bad idea is is the basis of it the reason is because it's used for two totally different purposes so you can't really grep very effectively for things like i don't ever need to grep for whether i have functions that are defined static because all my functions usually can be defined static I definitely want to know if there's any variables defined static. Like, that's really important to know. Um, so the keywords, what I would have done if it were up to me is I would have had the following be keywords. I would have had um, them be function and external function. And these would have mapped to static and you know, nothing, right? Uh, and you would have had to have put these in front of everything. So whenever you defined a function, you would say function void foo, and you would go, right? And that would default to internal linkage only. So only in the same compilation module. And then if you wanted something exported, you would have said that. Now, I don't care what these are, you know, maybe you don't want to type that much, so it's just func and, you know, efunc or something, right? I don't care. But, but that's what I wanted the keywords to be. Static and nothing, not cool, right? Uh, that is just not what should be there. And especially because in, in, uh, if you want to make lightweight text processors, for example, that look at C code or something, the fact that it's just a type name that starts a function is also terrible, right? Because it means you have to have global awareness of the entire set of things that happen in the program in order just to even know if something's a function half the time, right? Uh, but anyway, so I would have done that. And then the other thing I would have done is I would have had keywords for like global variable or something um, and uh, local persistent variable, right? And those would have mapped both to what the C currently defines as static uh, and, and basically, you know, and you would have had to have said which one of these you were talking about, right? And again, maybe you just want them to be like, you know, x glob and, you know, glob and local position or something, right? So they can be terse if you want, I don't care, but they should have been keywords and they should have had a different one for each case. Um, so I think that makes sense, right? Is there a way to suggest or home the processor that a branch is likely or not likely to be taken Goal is to help with branch prediction. Um, mm, well, so, yeah. I wanna say the answer is currently no. I wanna say the answer is currently no. Don't quote me on that, because I'd have to go look it up. 
but I think the answer is currently no, there isn't. Um, there has been many times, many ways, uh, as they say in the Merry Christmas song. So there used to be things where like the branch predictor would initialize to assume that like backward branches were taken and forward branches weren't. So you could always structure your code so that the positive side of an if statement was the most likely case and the else was the least likely and loops were always biased that way, right? That was a thing that used to happen on certain CPUs, if I remember correctly. There was uh, branch prediction bits. So there were ways you could actually put into the assembly language or the machine code um, into the jump instructions on certain CPUs where things would say a hint as to whether this is commonly taken or commonly not. Uh, I remember at least two, those two things. I want to say that none of those are true anymore. I, I could be wrong because I'm not up to date on some of these things. I haven't looked at branch prediction in a while. But I want to say that currently the Intel and AMD branch prediction architectures are their own thing that just, I, I don't know that they really have the ability to be hinted at anymore. Um, maybe there is, I don't know, you would have to go look. But I don't know of a way to do it anymore. Um, so I'm sorry, you're going to have to go read the docs, I think is the real answer. Watching earlier stream, we said something along the lines of, I've never worked on a commercial compiler, so have you ever worked on a non-commercial compiler? Uh, yes, I, I have worked on non-commercial compilers, uh, meaning like internal things that do compilation stuff. Some of them were more like text translators. Like at RAD, I wrote some text translators that we used which Fabian always had the dubious honor of having to turn into real compilers later. Because the, one of the weird things that always happens, it seems, if you ever make something that's just a simple text translator, people will start using it and they'll end up wanting it to eventually be a full compiler. That's just what it, that's just, it just, uh, I don't know why, that's just what happens. So, Uh, stuff has a way of sticking around a lot longer than it was supposed to. That's just what happens. Uh, but yeah, and then internally I've done some uh, more real compiler work at Molly Rocket for just stuff we use internally. And that stuff's more of real comp compiler stuff. Uh, the stuff I did at RAD was not really. Although I did do one thing that was sort of real compiler, the optimizing backend uh, that I did for Xbox 360 as a test. Uh, that one was fairly real, but we didn't end up using it because we ended up changing the way we were doing stuff on that platform anyway. Uh, what C++ books do you remember, recommend for beginner? I don't have any recommendations for that. I'm sorry. Uh, what's your guess on how much faster GPU trilinear sampling is compared to CPU side? Also, could you not bounce the light on GPU side and be faster even on non-RTX cards? What are the reasons against doing that? Is it just to keep complexity at HMH scope? Um, I don't actually, the, the reason is mostly that no, I don't think we can. Um, so basically what we're going to have to do, I think, um, is we're going to have some lighting, we're going to have to have some lighting quality uh, controls. And I'm guessing that we will do very simplistic lighting output on sort of lower end stuff. And so while maybe the card that's in my machine now, it might, this, this machine might have a 1080 in it, in which case, sure, we could do uh, ray tracing on the card side and it would probably be faster than the, than the CPU. Um, but that's not necessarily going to be the minimum specs we're shooting for. I mean, if we try to port Handmade Hero to, to Raspberry Pi, right, we need a way of doing some lighting somewhere and then outputting it in a way that could be used, right? And so I just don't want to take the full leap of going, this game requires GPU ray tracing, because that just really limits what you can run on, right? Um... So we will probably just write some CPU stuff that we use uh, that's like a much simpler version of this that we run on lower end stuff. 
And furthermore, uh, on machines with like Intel iGPUs and stuff, I would wager that you could still do like the full ray tracing because it might be a very good, uh, the, the CPU might be great, right? But the GPU would never be able to do a good job of ray tracing, right? Um, so I think it's just, you have to respect the heterogeneity there. So if we can, if we can make the CPU do the ray casting fast enough, we probably should. Because it's not going to be used for anything else in this game. We don't, have, we don't have any physics sim or stuff like that that we're really using it for. So I think we want to take advantage of that so that we can run on, on crappy GPUs, basically. It seems unlikely that Intel MD would change behavior of branch picking considering things like PGO and GCC built in expected some behavior. Oh, they did. Like the AMD branch predictor, predictor in Ryzen 2 is totally different than the branch predictor, predictor even in Ryzen 1, but certainly in, than in Bulldozer. It's totally different. So it changes completely from architecture to architecture. Uh, so trust me, it's totally different. Have you considered the fact that if you just said Handmade Hero had an AI-based lighting solution, you could say it was done now? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I understand you're doing a Unity build in Handmade Hero. What's the meaning of internal in this scenario? Um, well, again, it just, if you don't put it, then the C compiler thinks everything needs to be external and that costs you extra linking time because you outputted a bunch of data you didn't need to output. So even when you're doing a Unity build, you still want to say all of this stuff is within this compilation unit. So don't do any extra work, right? You need to tell the compiler that. Because it doesn't know that's what you're doing. Enthusiast. Hi, I got contacted by two companies to work as a C programmer, one job on the numerical computing data visualization side and one on the cryptography. They also wrote to me that they have a hard time in finding people who are interested in the low level programming. Do you think it is because the majority of people use Python, JavaScript, or high level languages? I guess there's always a job if someone could do C and a bit of assembly. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is exactly what I said before. Um, there's almost nobody knows how to do this kind of programming anymore. Uh, programmers who know anything about how to do Low-level programming are very valuable everywhere because they're the only people who know how to like actually make things run smoothly or fast, right? Um, so yes, I mean it's there's always a job for you if you know how to do the sorts of stuff we do on Handmade Hero because nobody does. It's not that there's like millions of jobs for it; it's just that there's nobody who can do it. So it's just it's just a supply issue, right? When running Visual Studio with my executable as an argument, I can't find the project properties properties window in which you set the pound defines. Uh, dude, I don't, I don't know about Visual Studio. Like, like Visual Studio is a pile of crap. Go get Remedy. That's my advice. Just catching up on the show again. What do we have left other than lighting and actual gameplay? Um, so not really anything, but uh, the gameplay stuff will be kind of slow at first, I think, because we'll want to, uh, there's two things I think want to be tightened up there. One is we need the collision detector to be back in there for like projectiles. So that'll probably get tuned a little bit because that really never got done. That was just kind of sitting in there. Um, but the other thing that, uh, I would want to, um, the other thing that I, that I think we're gonna wanna do is the tag-based matching sucks right now. And so what I wanna do is like write some gameplay code uh, and do the Snuffleupagus thing, stuff, the Snuffleupagus oriented programming where we just go, okay, now that we're actually writing real gameplay code, what do we wanna type in here to say like how these things should have their graphics assigned and then go fix the tag code to work that way. So that, wants to happen too. That can happen with the gameplay code, though it doesn't have to be a separate step. Um, but yeah, but I would say the collision detector needs to be fixed and like get that part of the code like correct again. 
again, we can do that while we're doing gameplay programming, though. We don't, like, that doesn't need to be a separate phase, but when we go do gameplay programming, we're going to be like, okay, how do we want Clutch Detector to work here? Like, let's go, like, clean that up and make that robust, right? I don't think there's really anything else. I mean, there's a lot of cleanup work we can do. Um, so, you know, cleaning things up, we could spend a few weeks on just getting, like, stuff kind of organized now that we have everything done for the engine. Um, but I don't know that we need, we could probably just do some gameplay stuff first before we do that, just to make sure we validate everything out first. So I would probably say we'd start the gameplay first, then take a break from the gameplay once we have some basic gameplay in there and say, okay, this is basically what it's supposed to play like, you know, it's like a, like a you know, first level kind of thing, then clean everything up, then push forwards. That seems sane. Which features of C++ do you think are conductive, or con sorry, conducive to performance-oriented programming, and which do you think are detrimental and should be avoided? I noticed that you use default arguments sometimes, for example. Um, I would say C++ it really doesn't have almost anything in it that you want. Uh, the only things I would use are operator overloading, default parameters, although I think C has that now, um, and declare anywhere, which C also has now. Um, Constructor-destructor pairs are sometimes useful for automatic things like count block. Uh, so constructor-destructor pairs for structs, uh, maybe, but I don't really care. You don't really have to use it. It's just a convenience, a mild convenience that I can easily live without. Um, so yeah. When adding the normals together, doesn't immediately normalizing after each add make the result dependent on the order of the vectors? Um, yes, it does, but we're not doing that. Uh, at least not that I remember. So if you look, when we actually do our normal accumulation step, um, so you can see we do not normalize uh, during our normal accumulation step, right? So there's the accumulation step right there, uh, and it does not normalize, right? Uh, so... You know, that's, that's that. Uh, we probably should normalize this sample down here, um, but that's another story. So the place that you might be thinking of is the place where we update the voxel for the frame, uh, but that one's fine because that's just doing one update per frame, right? So this right here uh, is just saying, look, we've now produced the new result for the, for the frame, uh, so let's normalize it. And we always want to start with a normalized normal, right? So that that doesn't does that does that help? I hope. All right, we good? All right, don't see any questions, more on topic questions. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, close this out. All right. Uh, oh, someone said, uh, as you remember, we talked about Valve ACO shader compiler that is replacing LLVM. I heard that it reduced the shader compile time significantly. They said that it is great for the open source graphics driver on Linux. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that seems good. I have not looked at it yet, though. Uh, also, I don't program on Linux. But Do we track light energy? Um, <clears throat> So we do, but at the moment, it's kind of an abstract value. So we don't make an attempt to try and have the light energy correspond to an actual real value. Uh, like we're not trying to actually measure flux in like real physical units. Um, so we kind of have an abstract value that we claim to convect around, which is photons per second by some scale which is just how we're thinking of it. Uh, 
And the, the reason it's not really physical is because that scale value is arbitrary. Like we're not saying what it is. We're just saying, look, this is a measure of the number of photons per second that pass through this point. V vaguely, right? Um, and so we're not really trying to, um, uh, to measure that. How is the radiance different from radiance? Uh, well, they're not really different. It's just trying to, it's trying to talk about whether something's coming in or going out, right? Um, so like radiance is what comes out and irradiance is what comes in, right? Uh, so if you look, um, let me see if I can actually get, this is, this is, so, so this is the value we want, right? So irradiance is the radiant flux received by a surface per unit area, right? So irradiance coming in. Whereas radiance, I believe, is going out, typically, right? Yeah, in radiometry, radiance is the radiant flux emitted, right? Uh, or, you know, reflected, basically coming out, right? Um, and it looks like maybe you could have used that for received as well. So I don't know. I'm not sure about the terminology exactly there. But the point is, when you say irradiance, you specifically mean that it's what's entering the surface at that point, like what's entering the, the equation from the outside, not stuff that's going, that you're sending back into the environment from uh, the system, right? So I think um, really the only reason we use that term irradiance is just to make it clear that we're talking about stuff that's coming in, right? Um, and and radiance is talking about what's going out. That's usually how I think about them anyway. And YMM0, I don't think radiance and irradiance are measured differently though. I don't think it, when you say irradiance, you're talking about a different measure than radiance, meaning, I think irradiance is still per surface area per solid angle, right? Meaning that it does not change. It's just talking about the fact that it's incoming, right? It's not, it's not that it's measured in a different measure, is it? Because I don't, I don't think that's true. Might be, though. So they are different units? All right, so I guess they're different units as well. So when you talk about the outgoing, you're, you actually change the units, apparently. That part, I don't know. I usually have to go study that stuff pretty carefully when I go to write anything that actually does tries to do a lighting reflectance. I find it pretty confusing to remember it all. Uh, <clears throat> at some point, I should probably sit down and work it out myself in a way that I like to think about it so that it would stick. Um, but either way, the point is simply that irradiance is what's coming in. So that's why I use that term uh, instead of just saying radiance. I'm not trying to talk about any specific units at all. I'm just trying to talk about the fact that if I say irradiance, IRR, uh, as opposed to radiance with just an R, uh, I'm just trying to say it's coming in, right? Have you read Sean Barrett's post on anti-aliasing? Um, I don't think so. Um, I remember this when he was working on it, but I At least I think I do. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I don't remember reading this, though. I don't think I've ever seen this actual post. All right. Let's go ahead and close it down.
thank you everyone for uh, tuning in for another episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along with the series at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes the source code so you can follow along with me as we code it. Um, also, in theory, the watch page is working again now because I went and updated the, the uh, server to use the, um, the new Twitch API. So in theory, now you come here, you should get the old behavior where, you know, it's me talking like this whenever the show is live. And whenever the show is not live, it should revert back um, to uh, having just the, the schedule posted there. Uh, so that's about it. Uh, I'll be back here next week for uh, us to sort of start working through some of those lighting to-dos. Um, until then, have fun programming, everyone, and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.